You got baseball coming up later on today. You got the Phillies and the Mets, and then you got Dodgers at the Padres coming up at 9 Eastern. Bob Costas on the call for the Yankees game with the Kansas City Royals, MLB Network host and Hall of Fame sportscaster. When the playoffs started, Bob, a couple of baseball writers said all 12 teams could win the World Series. Do you feel the same way when that happened, when that started? Well, all 12 teams have a shot to win a given series. And as I said to you before, if when the playoffs start under this format, you could take any team you want from either league and I take the field, I'd like my chances. Uh, because so many good teams, 100 win teams have been knocked out, especially treacherous is the division series round with the odd number of off days. So a lesser team can get by maybe with only two good starters. Detroit may get by with only one good starter, but he's the best pitcher in baseball, best starter in baseball this year. Uh, once you get to the LCS, it's a more legitimate test. But think about last year. The Diamondbacks knock off the Dodgers, a team that finished 16 games ahead of them in the same division. They get all the way through to the World Series. The team they meet, the Texas Rangers, is in effect a wild card team. They tied the Astros for first place, but there was a tiebreaker. So they had to play in the wild card round. So both those teams had to play in the wild card round. They both made it to the World Series. Were they the best teams in their respective leagues over the course of the season? No. But the days of an old pennant race, win it, or even the old LCS, win the division, have to finish first, go to the LCS. That's the one thing. Then you get to the World Series. Those days are behind us. There's a lot of pluses to this. I mean, there's been a lot of great games. And I've had a lot of people say, you know, it just almost feels like March Madness in a sense. I'm watching four games at once and we're going around with the highlights and everybody's got a shot and there, there are interesting things happening. And that's what baseball wanted. And even if you're not among the 12 teams, there were enough teams close enough into the last week or so to keep their fan bases engaged. That's the trade-off. Are you going to always get the purest matchup between the two best teams in the league? No. In fact, I would think less often than not that would that would happen. But there are upsides to the setup, too. I love the best of three. I just it, it created tension, um, immediacy. Mm -hmm. uh, each game mattered, and and maybe it's not fair, but I always feel like if if you got 162 games to alter your course there, and if it comes down to this, and you know some of these teams had all three home games if they got yeah. to that, so I I was fine with it. I don't want all the playoff series like that. Uh, where do you stand on that? Well, the, the difference between baseball and other sports has to be taken into account. Baseball plays 162, twice as many as the NHL and the NBA, and roughly 10 times as many. Uh, did I say the NHL and NBA? Yes, I did. And roughly 10 times. I didn't get much sleep last night, Dan. <laughs> I got to get on a plane to Kansas City. I'm a little groggy. But 10 times as much uh, as the NFL. And so there's a legitimate feeling that you want to honor what happens over the course of that long season. Playoff qualifying seems different in baseball. That doesn't mean that this format uh, is bad, but almost any format, if you want that many teams to be in it, is going to be imperfect to one extent or another. But this one does yield some excitement in the early rounds. No question about it. And I love that Detroit is in. I watched almost all of that game yesterday. Mm -hmm. Scooble is, I mean, dominating. Um, yeah. And, you know, I just, it's a young team. Uh, A.J. Hinch gets a, a chance to, you know, come back. Um, Kansas City, although they won in, what, 2015, they're still, mm -hmm. I mean, I love that. Then you get the Padres and the Dodgers that it feels like Yankees and Red Sox. Uh, yeah. You know, so there, there's a lot of matchups, a lot of fun things. And then you throw in the Phillies and the Mets, and it doesn't matter if it's exhibition you know, spring training or, you know, or a playoff. Um, so that, that, I think the match, I think baseball's yeah. had a really good year this year. I think so too, uh, with historic performances by Otani uh, and Judge. Judge continues to struggle in the postseason. That's a, another subplot in all of this. And Bobby Witt Jr. emerging as one of the best all round players in recent seasons. There's a lot of, a lot to like in this baseball season. And to your point earlier, the Padres and the Dodgers feels like a real rivalry. Yeah. It felt like that before the game on Sunday night. Then you got people throwing stuff, which you can't applaud, at Profar. And then apparently Manny Machado tossed a baseball in the direction of Dave Roberts. And Roberts is a pretty even keel guy. But he said it had some mustard on it, and I found it to be disrespectful. 
So the atmospheres for games three and four in San Diego should be pretty raucous as well, as long as everybody stays in their seats and yells and screams as much as they want, but doesn't do anything more than that. But, you know, they play in the same division, just like the Tigers and the Guardians do in the same division, the Mets and the Phillies in the same division. So there's that familiarity with all the games played during the regular season, and now they meet again in October. And because of the proximity, you're going to have even more visiting fans if they can score a ticket somehow even more visiting fans in the other team's ballpark. In fact, I said to Ron Darling during game one, this is the only series where a plane ride is required between New York and Kansas City. I think they should go old school and take a train and everybody wears suspenders and smokes cigars and reads the sporting news. And it's in black and white. And it looks like a scene out of the natural. Would you be willing to take a train today to Kansas City, Bob? Absolutely not. <laughs> Even the club car on a cellar. I'm not going that far on a train. We've tried to put Otani's season in perspective. And, you know, I'm looking at a hitter and a hitter in a regular season. The the only other, you know, that moment where he has the three homers, like, mm -hmm. is that the greatest game ever for a hitter? And I, I still brought him, even though it's two games, Ted Williams on that final day when he could have sat out and he played both ends of the doubleheader and batted 406. That's the only thing that I thought might be a comparison to that. Yeah. Um, your thoughts? Well, I think of the Sandberg game 40 years ago on the NBC game of the week when Ryan Sandberg went five for six and hit two homers, last ditch homers, off Bruce Souter. They use relief pitchers differently then. I think Whitey Herzog had Suter in there for at least three innings. So Sandberg homers to tie it on the ninth. He homers again in the tenth with two out to tie it again. And it was immediately dubbed the Sandberg game. And that's what people around um, Chicago still refer to it as. Um, and it was on a national broadcast when the game of the week was something different than it is now when you have so many ways to access baseball. Fred Lynn had a game during his rookie of the year MVP year in 75 for the Red Sox where he hit three home runs and had 10 RBIs at Tiger Stadium. Uh, but what Otani did here, and then, of course, if you think of something happening in the World Series, you think of Reggie Jackson hitting three home runs in a deciding World Series game. It's more meaningful. I think of some of the games that George Brett had. He had a three-homer game, every homer off Catfish Hunter <laughs> in the LCS in either 77 or 78. And he had another game in 85 where he had two homers, a double and a single, and the double hit the top of the wall uh, against Toronto. Brett is one of the all-time great postseason performers. The thing about this, though, is not only did he have five hits and three home runs, and he almost had the cycle. He was thrown out at third trying to stretch a double. He had two doubles, so he's thrown out at third, could have had the cycle, and he passed both milestones. He passed the 50 and the 50 in the same game. So I think that, that this has elements that surround it. You could look at others and say, I can make a case for this or that. But for now, Otani will do. Could he be underrated? I don't know how he could be underrated. Um, he's been certainly celebrated. Uh, people will interpret what I'm about to say wrongly. But it would be a great thing for baseball in the big picture if Otani, who'd never played in a playoff game with the Angels, if Otani got to the World Series, and if Judge snapped out of it and hit a few homers on the way to the World Series, and you got Yankees, Dodgers, not just because of the markets, but because these are the two players who, to the casual fan, is immediately recognizable. You can grasp what they've done. You can grasp that they're both historic players. Now, I know that you will have comments saying, oh, it's a big market bias. Hey, if the Tigers make it, if Kansas City plays the Tigers or the Guardians in the LCS, that's good for baseball in its own way. But if you're just looking for a big boost in World Series ratings, you got the combination of the markets and the two marquee players, that would be the best in that respect for baseball. Well, when I say underrated, because we didn't know that he was capable of stealing 60 bases. Yeah. Um, and, and even the pitching part of it, that'll come back next year, and he probably won't come close to these numbers. Uh, he won't be running yeah. the bases this way. Right. But it's almost like, um, I can't do that. I'm going to show you something else that I can do. Yeah. This year, minus the pitching, kind of liberated him yeah. to run the bases. And maybe uh, it accounts for a portion of what he's done at the plate because he doesn't have uh, as much stress on his body and on his attentions, maybe. But as everyone has said, and it's true, he's a unicorn. Is he the greatest player 
You can make a case for many others. But is he the most talented player? Certainly that I've ever seen. Willie, it's not to say that he's a greater all-round player than Willie Mays. I mean, he's never played the field to any uh, significant extent. He's a DH. But we've never seen someone who simultaneously does the two things or the multiple things, if you count the base stealing, that Otani does. Because as we said before, we know that Ruth would have been a Hall of Famer as a pitcher had he never switched to the outfield. But he didn't really do the two simultaneously to any great extent, and Otani has. Do you remember when we were at the Mets-Astros playoff game and Pete Rose said to us, we were at the top of the steps, and he said, who do you like today? Do you remember that? I do. Yeah. I do. And, you know, I was telling Aaron Boone, we were just having a conversation before the game, and, you know, Aaron knew Pete from the time he was a little kid because his dad, Bob Boone, was a Phillies teammate uh, of Pete Rose. And you want to talk about six degrees of Kevin Bacon? If you talk to Aaron Boone, you can connect him to just about everybody, including people from before the midpoint of the 20th century, because his grandfather yeah. broke it in 1948. <laughs> so we're talking about Pete Rose. And it occurred to me, I hadn't thought about this in a very long time. It's around 1981, and I'm just starting out with NBC. And I'm standing in front of the Phillies dugout, and Pete Rose is playing catch, just warming up before the game. And he glances over and he goes, I see you. You do those Big Ten basketball games. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, Pete Rose knows who I am. But then a few years later, it dawned on me what that was really all about. <laughs> he was betting yeah. on those Big Ten games. <laughs> Absolutely. What's, what's the line on Michigan yeah. State Northwestern <laughs> on a Tuesday night in February? Did we put to bet? I don't know what we accomplished with discussing Pete and his legacy and moving forward. I don't know. It just felt like it was the same story with Pete, and yeah. it never changed. You know, I'm repeating myself here. Nobody's nominating Pete Rose for Citizen of the Year. But not only was he a truly great player, just on the numbers, he's a Hall of Fame caliber player, but he was so iconic in the way he played the game and a bigger than life personality and part of one of the great teams, the Big Red Machine. And it's not just in the aftermath of his death. I've been saying this for more than 30 years. Baseball should have made a distinction. Now, I know that technically it's the board of directors of the Hall of Fame, but if any of the commissioners had said, hey, come on, it's okay with us, that would have influenced the board of directors. They could have made a simple distinction. He is rightly banned from any official part in baseball because he broke the cardinal rule, but he's on the Hall of Fame ballot. People who poisoned the record books by taking steroids probably damaged the game more than Pete Rowe has ever damaged the game. They're on the ballot, whether they make it in or not, they're on the ballot. Um, and if he winds up getting in posthumously now, it's almost like they're twisting the knife, whether that's their intention or not. And I know that there were unsavory things connected to Pete, uh, but somebody got those 4,256 base hits. And I've always said, you could put it at the bottom of the plaque, along with all the achievements, banned from baseball in 1989 for gambling. And in the immediate aftermath, Faye Vincent, who succeeded Bart Giamatti and was one of Bart's closest friends, if he had lifted that ban on, in terms of the Hall of Fame, that would have seemed too lenient. But as time went by, you get to the turn of the century, I think everybody would have grasped it. Eligible because of what he did historically, eligible for the Hall, no longer officially connected to baseball. That's the punishment. And people who say, well, you know, baseball, like every other sport, has now embraced gambling, so it's hypocritical. I, I get that atmospherically, that's a bad look, but it's still the rule yeah. for any player. If you bet on a game in which you're not involved in baseball, you can bet on football or basketball, but if you bet on a game that you're not involved in, automatic at least one game suspension, then you can, uh, one year suspension, then you can apply for reinstatement. But if you bet on a game in which you are involved, including if you bet on your own team, the rule is still exactly the same as it's been for decades and decades, lifetime banishment. But if he was in the Hall of Fame, do you think mm -hmm. if they found out that he gambled uh, later, would they have taken him out of the Hall of Fame? Let's say just baseball-wise, his career, Hall of Famer. Then he becomes a manager, let's say, six years after he's in the Hall of Fame. And then he's betting on baseball. They find that out. Would they have taken him out of the Hall of Fame? See, but at that point, he couldn't have managed in baseball. 
by what I just suggested. He's banned from baseball. No, no, no. Let's say, that, no, they don't catch him. No, oh, I see. No, so he's in the Hall of Fame for his playing career. He waits six years. The Reds bring him in to be their manager. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden he bets on baseball. Would they have taken him out of the Hall of Fame? That's a tricky one. I guess not, but they might have altered the plaque. Okay. To indicate, you know, what the circumstances are. For those who haven't uh, been to the Hall of Fame, they think of, some people think of it as just the plaque gallery. That's part of it. But it's a much larger museum. And Pete Rose and Joe Jackson and all the supposed steroid guys, they're all represented yeah. in terms of their place in baseball history throughout the museum. But it's the plaque gallery where Pete Rose is missing. Um, I mentioned this uh, on the air right after he died someplace or other. Um, I went to the Hall of Fame with Pete for a piece for the Today Show sometime in the 90s. And he had not set foot in the Hall of Fame after since Barjamati had banned him. And at one point, he walked over to Ty Cobb's plaque. And Pete was not a reflective man at all. But in that moment, you could tell he was reflecting. And I actually backed away to give him some space. And you could tell that he's looking at this plaque and saying, hey, I'm connected historically to this guy, this guy I never met. I'm connected to Ty Cobb. Why am I not here represented in this gallery? Well, the answer is mostly by your own doing. But justice can be tempered with mercy. I don't think if Pete Rose had gotten into the Hall of Fame, let's say in 2005, 2010, and he had the plaque in the fashion that I suggested, no little kid is going to walk through the Hall of Fame with his dad, look at the plaque and say, gee, dad, I guess it's okay then if I get to the major leagues and I bet on baseball. I mean, the cautionary tale is there. Yeah. It, it was in the first paragraph of his obituary. And we knew that for decades, that it would be in the first paragraph of his obituary. He paid a huge price, even if he was, even if it was by his own doing, he paid a huge price. Yeah, I, I did ask Johnny Bench after Pete died. I said, did yeah, you? Yeah, I saw that segment. Yeah, I, I said, did you, did you have any idea if he was betting on baseball as a player? And he said, well, I was told by the FBI, you know, to stay away. I, I think the reason why Pete is never going to be on the ballot is those, those commissioners know that Pete bet as a player. And I, yeah. I, and I think that that might be the, the point of no return. You know, that may be true. I asked Rob Manfred in an interview a few years ago, is there something that the general public and those of us in the media pay, att pay attention to or would know about? Is there something that we don't know about that influences this decision? Something more damning than what we know or additionally damning to what we know? And Manfred's answer was no. Yeah, I don't believe it. Don't believe it. Had too many conversations with Bud Selig where I just got it. I got a sense that there was something there. Uh, I, I, and I don't think Pete all of a sudden goes, hey, I'm just going to start gambling on baseball as a manager and not as a player. I, what, I, yeah, I, what I, you're saying is, is logical. Yeah, I know. We don't know the answer for sure, but it's certainly a logical question. Great to talk to you. Uh, safe travels to Kansas City. Thank you, Dan. All right, bud. That's Bob Costas, uh, TNT, the ex uh, exclusive home of the ALDS, ALCS. Bob on the call with uh, Ron Darling, and uh, that'll be coming up tomorrow, Game 3 in Kansas City.